Yes, the masked professor is on the air again. Hello, sports fans. And once again, we're here for Human Factors. Today, we will be covering Chapter 14, Safety and Accident Prevention. Although I do not expect to finish that chapter today. We'll see. All right. So, we begin with the story at the beginning of the chapter. Marta loved her new job at the convenience store. One morning, as she was busy restocking shelves, she turned a corner to go down an aisle on the far side of the store. A glare came in through the large window, which is probably why she did not see the liquid that it had spilled on the floor. She slipped on the substance and fell, impaling her arm on a blunt metal spike meant to hold chips. Her arm never healed properly, and she had back problems for the remainder of her life. John walked across a bare agricultural field to where a six-inch diameter irrigation pipe came out of the ground. The opening was filled by a large chunk of ice, so John began using a steel pry bar to dislodge the, the chunk. As the ice chunk broke free, air pressure that had built up in the pipe suddenly drove the ice up against the pry bar. The force sent the, bar the bar through John's neck and impaled him backwards to the ground. Amazingly, John was taken to the hospital and lived. Steve and Pete were fighting a canyon forest fire along with several other relatively new firefighters. Suddenly, a high wind drove the fire towards them and all of the men began running to escape the coming, oncoming blades. Realizing that they would be overtaken at any moment, Steve and Pete quickly set up their survival tents and crawled inside. In the meantime, two other men, who had thrown aside their heavy survival tents in order to run faster, were forced to try and escape by running up a steep, steep hill. The men in the survival tent died, and the men who had run out uh, made it to safety. One more story and I promise I'll stop. A four-year-old boy in California climbed up on a new concrete fountain in his backyard to retrieve a ball from the basin area. As he pulled himself up, the fountain toppled over and crushed him to death. His parents successfully sued the manufacturer and landscape company who installed it. Okay, so... These, the authors tell us, are all true stories of safety failures or accidents. Of course, one of the major goals of human factors is to increase health and safety of people. Safety focuses on accidents in acute conditions or events. Health focuses on less intense, prolonged conditions. Okay, so safety and health, there is a dividing line there. All right, uh, introduction to safety and accident prevention. Safety and accident prevention is a major concern of human factors, as it should be for all of us. When we start thinking about car accidents, falls, poisoning, or workplace accidents, I'm going to say, uh, uh, we see a lot of things going on. Our uh, car accidents 
in this era are lower than they were, oh, call it 40 years ago. But still, we're talking about 30,000 deaths a year. Um, all right, so let's look at our table 14.1. most frequent causes of deaths and injuries. Boy, that not that a cheerful talk, topic? All right, injury is most often caused by overexertion. Uh, in other words, working beyond your physical limits. Impact accidents being struck by an object or being flung against an object, falls, bodily reaction to chemicals, compression, motor vehicle accidents, exposure to radiation or caustic substances, rubbing or abrasions, and exposure to extreme temperatures. Again, these are the most frequent causes of injury. When we start talking about deaths, motor vehicle related deaths are at the top of the list. Falls, electric current, drowning, fire related deaths, air transport related deaths, poison, and water transport related. I am doubting that these are in uh, order of uh, the number of uh, injuries and deaths. Um, so, one thing that has happened is now we have more safety legislation. It used to be that we had a laissez-faire um, uh, type of workplace environment. So unsafe, unhealthful conditions, it was assumed it was a let the buyer beware condition. So, uh, uh, so the 19th century factory or mine or even farm was an extremely dangerous place. In fact, farming is still an extremely dangerous occupation. Uh, okay, well, Pardon me while I do a quick uh, amount of fixing. So, it came down to lawsuits about employers' negligence. Negligence being failure to exercise a reasonable amount of care or to carry out a legal duty so that injury or property damage occurs to another. All right, well, there are some problems here. For one thing, a reasonable amount of care is a very ill-defined concept. The employers uh, would constantly claim that the employee uh, did something uh, that contributed to contributory negligence, uh, that a fellow employee of the one injured was negligent or that the injured worker was aware of hazards and they assumed the risk. Well, that brought us to the 1909-1910 when many states began to draft workmen's compensation laws. In those laws they said there was no fault uh, the worker was injured. We're not going to point the finger at anyone. 
Montana had put in a statute for minors and New York for uh, eight different hazardous occupations. However, these laws were thrown out as unconstitutional. But a short time later, in 1917, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, declared state workers' comp laws constitutional. How quickly things change. Today, about 80% of workers are covered. Or at least that's the figure given in our book that may have, uh, uh, the percentage may be higher now. So, the goals of workers' comp are to provide sure, prompt, and reasonable income and medical benefits regardless of fault. It gives us a single remedy um, uh, to uh, reduce court delays, costs, and workloads uh, from arising uh, from personal injury suits. So, it also eliminates payment of fees to lawyers and witnesses. It in, ensures, or encourages at the very least, that the employers have interest in safety of the workers and rehabilitation of ones who get injured. And it's helped to promote the study of causes of accidents. All right, so we can think of uh, workers' compensation as um, a kind of insurance. You have, you are covered under workman's comp if it arose from an accident that arose out of your worker's employment and occurred during the course of employment. So, under the workman's comp, workers can't sue their employers, but they can sue third parties. Well, in 1970, we had the Occupational Safety and Health Act. That established OSHA under the Department of Labor. So, they uh, uh, have helped set up safety programs. They uh, set or revoke health and safety standards. They uh, conduct inspections investigate problems, they monitor illnesses and injuries arising from occupations or workplaces, they can issue citations, assess penalties, uh, they can uh, petition the courts about unsafe employers, they help with safety training, in, injury prevention consultations, and they have databases of health and safety statistics. Uh, okay, well, great. We have sets of OSHA standards specifically for construction, agriculture, and maritime uh, and there are a, a general set of rules about occupational health and safety.
All right. Well, on the other hand, we have NIOSH, uh, which is the uh, National Institute for Occupation and uh, Safety and Health. Uh, so they, uh, not preforms, but performs research and, and education. They conduct and review research about hazardous conditions in the workplace, and they prepare recommendations uh, as a result. All right, well, one thing that came up more in recent years is the idea of product liability. NIOSH is kind of slow and cumbersome to whip into action. And their penalties are not such that, um, that uh, corporations and companies are really quaking in their boots about having a penalty applied to them. So product liability suits are allowed for defective products. That can be a de design defect, a manufacturing defect, or a warning defect. One problem that can come up is, is the product de defective or is it just inherently dangerous? So suits have come about because people have injured themselves with knives, uh, uh, either uh, uh, pocket knives or kitchen knives, whatever. But a knife is an inherently dangerous object unless you can show that de design defect, manufacturing defect, or warning defect your suit isn't going to go anywhere. All right, so when we say that it is defective, that means it failed to perform safely as an ordinary user would expect when it was used in an intended or reasonably foreseeable manner or if the risks inherent in the design outweighed the benefits of that design. All right, so uh, we can see that definition. However, we sometimes get lawsuits where the product wasn't defective, the use was uh, not, I, a not intended use. Uh, and sometimes even, uh, even though it wasn't an intended use, the, uh, the lawsuit still wins through. All right, so important there are reasonably foreseeable and a trade-off between risk and benefit. All right, so factors that cause or contribute to accidents. Well, one thing that we use now very often is a systems approach. Um, the, uh, the old idea of safety was you would fly an airplane. This is in the early days of airplanes it would crash, you would fix what went wrong, and then you would fly again. Now we adopt a systems uh, approach which has uh, characteristics of we are looking at the employee performing the task, the task itself, the equipment that is used uh, directly or indirectly in the task.
Some other factors that come into play are the social psychological factors and environmental factors. And so I go to figure 14.1 on page 357. All right, so we look at what can be problems in a more holistic manner. All right, so we're looking at a management or design error might creep into the work system. But the work system itself, we're going to look at employee characteristics, job characteristics, equipment and tools, physical environment, social environment. All right, and we are saying, well, there are natural factors from the outside that might come in. We are saying that operator error is a possibility, either wholly or in a contributory manner. All of these hit a hazard, and then we have an accident or injury. I hate when that happens. All right, so let's think about a personal, not personnel, but personal characteristics. Okay, apparently I'm going to be jumping back and forth a lot. Uh, all right, figure 4.2. Lights, camera, action. Oh, bloody hell, I'm going to have to widen out again. Maybe one Titan, two Titans. All right. So we have the operator characteristics that can affect the steps of an accident. All right. So first we have hazard uh, exposure to a hazardous situation. Now, does the operator perceive the hazard. That relies on sensu sensory, perceptual uh, skills, and the state of alertness. Okay, well, if it's no, it comes down here. If it's yes, they do perceive the hazard. Do they recognize the hazard, the cognition aspect? That relies on experience, training, mental abilities, memory abilities. All right, so we assume they uh, understand what the hazard is. They come down here to decision to av avoid. Again, experience and training, attitude, motivation, risk-taking tendencies, and personality all come into play. That brings us down to the ability to avoid. Well, that comes down to anthropometry, biomechanics, motor skills. All right, so at any of these points, they could have jumped into unsafe behavior. Then there's a chance that they might just get off scot-free, don't even notice there was a problem. But there is a chance that there is an accident. By the same token, if we get all the way down here to safe behavior, we still have a chance of hitting an accident. Okay, so please remember what I told you to forget, as the old song reminds us. Oh, wait, no, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, all right, so let's talk about those personal characteristics. 
First of all, there's age and gender. Younger people have more accidents, and that is at the highest between 15 and 24. Human factor specialists are hard pressed to tell you why necessarily. Are old people more conservative? Do young people think there's less likelihood? Hey, that's not what I wanted at all. Um, young males, do they think they're uh, at less risk? Uh, or another... Um, favorite theory of mine, we know your judgment center is not fully developed until sometime between 25 and 27. That seems like it could influence this a lot. All right, well, accidents are tied to your physical and cognitive uh, ability. Uh, accidents go up again uh, as you get more and more elderly. In phys physically intense occupations uh, such as logging or, um, uh, or mining, the performance may decline by 35 and you may be washed up before you're 40. There is the question of your perceptual and cognitive abilities. At 50 to 60, you have a decreased useful field of vision. That could easily contribute to accidents. You also have a slowing of the information uh, processing and more difficulty in coding ambiguous si stimuli. Uh, in other words, you, there's a signal and you may not know what it means. All right, well, part of it is going to be job experience. 70% of accidents happen to people within their first three years on the job. Well, I beat the three-year rule here, uh, but then I had an accident uh, uh, a year ago last spring. Damn it, my seventh year, I almost made it through. The very peak of these accident, accident activities are likely to be at two to three months on the job. That's when you are in a uh, transitional stage Pardon me. Right? Your training has ended your hazard recognition, however, hasn't developed, and the appropriate response to si stimuli may not be available to you. All right, well, there's also uh, stress, fatigue, drugs, and alcohol. Well, any of these is a temporary characteristic Stress and fatigue are definitely factors in accidents. Driving on the road when you're fatigued is the equivalent of drunk driving. So we get performance decrements from life stressors, right? Your stress might be coming from your job uh, that uh, you are... Uh, uh, the boss is on you, uh, 
and you're afraid of getting fired, uh, maybe you're having a stressful time with your wife uh, or uh, other life partner. Employees under the influence of alcohol and drugs have a higher accident, accident rate. Um, we can see that drug use affects job performance and it's related through injury rates, turnovers, and workers' comp claims. Um, if we do drug testing, that will reduce the personal injury rate. But human factors experts are not sure if it's drug use itself that causes the injury rate or if it's symptomatic of uh, personal characteristics that cause uh, uh, higher accident rates. Um, so, uh, we are kind of in the dark. Uh, are these guys just so social deviants? We should cut them out of our society and, and send them to Coventry. Or exactly how should we uh, uh, how should we treat these problems? Um, all right. So some per, uh, personality traits are going to predict accident rates in high risk jobs. One is general deviance. Uh, they don't like to follow the rules. They don't like people telling them what to do. And then you, uh, uh, you tell them, don't walk out that door. There's no stairs outside. And they plunge to their deaths. All right, maybe it's not that dramatic. Job dissatisfaction is a personality trait that can lead to higher accident rates. Drug use, of course. Depression. Some people seem to have a higher tendency to uh, incur accidents. We call them accident prone. And we are unsure in the human factors uh, community what exactly is going on there? All right, one way we can deal with this is have employee assistance for psychosocial problems. All right, well, one thing that we can, uh, that we uh, think about in terms of safety is the job characteristics. We've talked about the personal characteristics and the job characteristics are going to make a difference. So, high physical workload could be a problem. High mental workload, again, could be an indicator that we're going to have uh, accidents. St uh, stress inducing factors such as vig vigilance tasks. All the way back during World War II, they did a human factors study on people that had to watch radar screens. And they found at that time, and I don't believe any research has uh, come along to deny this, that people are good for about 20 minutes of really concentrated attention, and that's it. And yet we have hour and a half classes. What's up with that? Other things that can happen, long work cycles. 
uh, if the work shift is 10 or 12 hours a day, by the end of that time, your assets are dragging and you may not be able to respond as quickly, think as quickly to avoid a problem. Shift rotations, constantly having your sleep interrupted because last week you were on the day shift, this week you're on the graveyard shift, can be a problem. All right, well, um, equi uh, the equipment, uh, controls and displays, uh, well, we've already seen that a poor design increases our likelihood of error. There could be electrical hazards, being struck by lightning. Ordinarily, you wouldn't think of that as an occupational injury, but for people that have to climb towers, cell phone towers or radio towers, could be a problem. For that matter, people who are just doing roofing and a sudden storm blows up. All right, so what is the problem is when an electric current goes through your body. Low current and low voltage are safer. It's uh, the threshold for penetrating the human body with uh, voltage is 24 volts. Oh, okay. For 60 hertz electricity, which of course is the basis of our um, uh, is the basis of our electrical grid in the United States and some other countries, the let go point is nine milliamp amperes. Uh, so, in other words, if it's at 9 milliamperes, you may be able to let go. Above that, you may not be able to let go. What happens when the electric current is going through you is you have a paralysis of your respiratory muscles. If that goes on for over three minutes, it is likely to cause death. So, if somebody gets caught by electrical current, take a two by four or some other non-conducting thing and knock them loose. If we're all the way up to 200 milliamperes, it's likely to throw the person away from the source. And I can tell you, I've had this experience myself. It was an exciting time. Alternating current is more dangerous uh, because it tends to be at um, higher voltages and uh, higher amperages. The, um, uh, the exception to this is batteries are very dangerous if you're wearing jewelry necklaces, rings, anything that conducts electricity. Many an airplane mechanic has burned a finger off by wearing their ring while they're working on the aircraft and it gets in touch with the two terminals of a NICAD battery. Um, you're going to have damage after 25 milliseconds of exposure to electricity. So, some ha hazards, well one way we can avoid them is using a lockout tagout procedure when circuits are being worked on or elect uh, equipment is being worked on that uses electricity, etc. Another uh, hazard is degradation of insulation. 
particularly in really old houses, uh, you had a kind of a cloth woven insulation and over the years that's been deteriorating. Can be a problem. All right, so we have regulations for wiring and insulation, for grounded outlets, insulation for anything that's going to come into human contact. We can use rubber gloves and rubber mats and fuses, breakers, ground fault, circuit interrupters uh, are all used. Now, just because a wire is insulated doesn't mean it's safe. You should exa examine the insulation on the wire. It will say to how many volts it is good. Well, of course, we also have uh, mechanical hazards and equipment uh, can have an incredibly high number of uh, mechanical hazards. So you have rotating equipment. Um, this is uh, one of the reasons they tell you not to wear loose clothing or jewelry in, a, uh, in an industrial setting. Um, because if you get caught, you are not more powerful than the machine. There can be open geared power presses. Uh, in fact, open gears uh, is just a problem in general, right? We want guards in place. Uh, power hander, uh, hammers. Now we're supposed to have things fetted with safeguards, but often people will take off the safeguard to replace a, um, excuse me, to replace a, um, uh, a V-belt uh, or uh, uh, because they need to uh, uh, grease the bearings and then they won't put it back. All right, so these kind of hazards, we can have tearing or cutting of the skin, muscle, bone, shearing, where two things come very close together uh, that are uh, uh, made of, of uh, steel or other hard substances, crushing, breaking, and straining. Straining is usually the best of these uh, to encounter. But not always. All right, so we use guards to reduce these mechanical hazards. But again, they're often removed and you should keep an eye open for that and make sure that they're replaced. Things that we can use as guards are total enclosures. In other words, we have something that's somewhat dangerous. It's totally fenced off so that you can't easily get to it. You have to have a key to the lock or some other situation of this type. Um, movable barriers. Um, and enclosures with inter interlocks. In other words, if the enclosure is open, the machine won't run. There are some other safety devices we can use. Um, sensors that interrupt the machines when there are body parts in the way. Uh, optical sensors, electrical fields that detect the change in the field if your hands are in the area or something like that. Sometimes we have machines with two hand controls so that you can only operate the machine using both hands so one hand can't be in an area where it might get hurt. 
You can also have arms that sweep everything out of the hazardous area. All right, so you can have pressure and toxic substance hazards. Uh, pressure, the most common kind is a ve vessel rupture, uh, a tank or a pipe. Uh, this is often called a hidden hazard because you're just walking by the tank and suddenly it blows out uh, and you get hit with a chunk of metal or, or just the shock wave. We often have liquids and gases contained in pressure vessels. And the rupture factor, factors can be things like direct heat, heat from the sun or nearby furnaces, overfilling the pressure vessel, and altitude changes. You may have noticed that buying chips up here uh, in the mountains the bag is always pretty puffed up. That's because it was bagged at a lower altitude. All right, so we can get injuries from the contents of the vessel, fragments of the vessel, the shock waves from the rupture, and we need to be careful of paint sprayers. Uh, a modern paint sprayer can penetrate your skin with the paint. And, depending on what kind of paint it is, it may be highly toxic. All right, so what are some safeguards we can use? Well, we can use safety valves so that we don't get an overpressure situation. We must make sure we depressurize the ve vessels before maintenance. We want to mark the vessels with the contents and warning labels. So you've noticed you often see trucks on the highway that have hazard signs. And sometimes it'll just write on there what kind of uh, contents it has. Sometimes it will... Uh, it will uh, actually just have a number. And we can use protective clothing. All right, so toxic substances come in several varieties. The first is asphyxiants. All right, I'm hoping it's spelled correctly. Um, all right. These are gases that cause an oxygen deficiency in, in your blood. Uh, carbon dioxide is an example. Carbon monoxide, your blood will absorb preferentially to oxygen. Methane, hyd uh, hydrogen, and remember, natural gas is colorless and odorless. Now you may be thinking, wait a minute, when if I turn on the stove and uh, the uh, pilot light is out, I smell something. That's because we add, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Um, it's the smelliest substance on earth. It's actually uh, was designed after the odor that a skunk sprays on you. Damn it, I can't think of it at the moment. Watch, 10 minutes from now I'll remember. All right, so after asphyxiants we have irritants. These are chemicals that inflame the tissues at the point of contact, cause redness, swelling, blisters, pain. Uh, and they can be a huge problem if they're inhaled or they're ingested. Now, these irritants, well, for example, the first uh, poison gases that were used during uh, World War I 
where chlorine was the first one used, chlorine combines with your, uh, uh, with your blood uh, being uh, in the same, uh, in the same uh, category as oxygen. Mustard gas is an irritant. Um, in fact, my great uncle George was gassed in the First World War. And my relatives used to tell me, oh, Uncle George is kind of strange because he was gassed in the First World War. But then one day my grandmother said, no, he was weird before he went off to war. All right. There are systemic poisons and they interfere with your organ functions. Um, so, for example, benzene, when it was first found, was considered to be a, a miracle chemical that could be used for all kinds of purposes. The problem was they found out that it was a carcinogen. It causes cancer of the liver. So, you can have systemic poisons or carcinogen carcinogens, both of those affect your body functioning. All right, so in 1987, OSHA required employers to start inform informing employees of hazardous materials. Before that, eh, who knows what's in there? Um, so the OSHA hazard communication standard uh, ensured that information is communicated to the employees so that comprehensive hazard communication programs, which are to include container labeling and other forms of warning, material safety data sheets, and employee training. All right, because so many common cleaning chemicals are very dangerous, this applies to almost any business. All right, so in our physical environment, first of all, illumination. Illumination it makes things safe or unsafe by making it easy or difficult to perform your uh, tasks. Phototropism means that you have a tendency to look at any area that is brighter. So it takes your attention away from the task and you have a problem of transient adaptation. And because I was looking in the direction of the camera, behind it you have my office which is lit and I saw my attention distracted there for a second. Noise and vibration are hazardous elements. Noise we talked about in um, the, um, uh, ba, 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 ba. I want to say it was chapter 5. Don't remember at this point. Vibration um, is a huge problem. And um, uh, actually one of the members of my PhD advisory committee was a, a researcher and kind of expert in vibration. Vibration comes in a lot of forms and it can cause severe nerve damage over time. All right, so temperature and uh, And humidity, uh, humidity, not humility. While humility can pr cause problems, usually they're personal to the person. All right, if it's too hot or it's too cold, that can be really a severe safety hazard. Impacts your body health, impacts operator, uh, 
impairs the operator performance. The protective closing may make it worse because it's limiting airflow and so your body's cooling mechanisms aren't as effective. Uh, a lot of times if you uh, have a problem because you got too hot or too cold, it affects you the rest of your life. Uh, I got a sunstroke as a young man and as a result it is hard for me to spend a lot of time out in the sun. When I do, I have to drape a bandana uh, around my head and wear a big hat and cover up my body. Of course, how many have asked me to keep covering up my body? Kind of hurts, guys. All right, so then we need to talk about fire hazards. If we're going to have a fire, we have to have fuel, we have to have an oxidizer, and we have to have a source of ignition. Oxidizers, well, fire is an oxidation reduction reaction. Oxygen is the most common, but fluorine and chlorine uh, because they are in the same column on the um, table of the elements, also will burn. The activation energy for ignition is usually heat, but it doesn't have to be. So some ignition sources are open flames, electric arcs or sparks, uh, that can include static electricity, of which we seem to have a lot here, or hot surfaces. And yes, Virginia, there is such a thing as spontaneous combustion. Um, for example, I noticed that in the Fab Lab, they were being very cavalier about their oily uh, rags and um, tissues. So I got them a, an oily rag uh, a can. I have not seen that since. Hell of a job. All right, so what happens in spontaneous combustion? The materials themselves are absorbing atmospheric uh, gases. As they're doing that, the oxidation reduction reaction is happening. So it's very common in fibrous materials with oils or fats. Why fibrous materials? Because you have more surface area to be in contact with oxygen. If they're in an enclosed location, the heat can't dissipate. The heat keeps accumulating until it eventually ignites. All right, so how do we fight this? Well, one thing is frequent disposal in airtight containers. Simple enough. Um, all right, so our next exciting uh, category is radiation hazards. Radioactive material has unstable atoms, but they become more stable by giving off that excess energy in the form of waves or particles. All right, what are the factors in criti criticality of exposure? Well, first there is the type of radiation. Uh, some types of radiation are extremely uh, uh, deadly, even in a very short time. 
there's the strength of the radiation, the amount of exposure you get, and there's the length of exposure. So a chronic low-level exposure sometimes is much safer than acute exposure. If we have higher chronic exposure levels, we can get long-term damage such as cancer. And acute doses of radiation are very hazardous. Look, radiation is nothing to fool around with. Um, falls are the second most frequent cause of worth workplace deaths. The most common, not commune, common injury is uh, broken bones. The most serious kind of fall injury is a head injury. In fact, I'm willing to say anytime you have a head injury could be serious. When in doubt, consult your doctor. All right. In fact, this is so common that OSHA has precautionary regulations about use of ladders and design of ladders. Some types of ladders aren't even uh, uh, supposed to be used anymore. Uh, for example, growing up in the theater, we used a kind of ladder all the time called an A-frame, right? It's shaped kind of like this, and then you have a vertical part that you can lift to whatever height you need to work at. These are supposed to be ban banned now. You're only supposed to use a person lift. All right, well, when we're talking about fire or really any kind of disaster, a vessel rupture, um, uh, toxic substance loose in the workplace, we have to talk about exits and emergency evacuation. This didn't receive much um, research attention until we had the 9-11 disaster. So now we're looking for more human factors research and more development within building codes of how to make better exits and emergency evacuation. I know back in the day when I was a kid, you would sometimes see uh, evacuation slides on buildings. That was supposed to be your fire exit if, if things went wrong. How come we don't do fun things like that anymore? Probably because people were killed. All right, so we must consider in our exits and emergency evacuations, what is the crowd going to do? Are they going to panic? I would count on that. There's probably going to be electric power outage, so we may not have the regular lighting, and we should consider emergency lighting. We might have concurrent hazards of explosions or toxic materials um, uh, going on during a disaster of this kind. So all of this is a special challenge to um, uh, to designers. Um, all right, so you can imagine 
uh, a panic crowd in a smoky and dark stairs. Not, uh, not a pretty idea. At the same time, you may have firefighters and rescue personnel going the other way. They may be carrying very uh, large or bulky equipment. We're going to, uh, we're likely to have loss of power and subsequently the lighting. And you're going to have uh, loud crowds uh, or loud sirens. So how do we So how do we make displays and controls that will help us ameliorate this situation? I have actually had colleagues of mine here at NTU argue that the doors that are clearly marked with exit signs are not fire exits. Holy crap, how ignorant can you be? All right, one thing that really affects safety is the social environment in which it uh, happens. So, our contextual factors affect the accident rates. Uh, whether it's directly or indirectly, I, it doesn't matter. It affects it. The social factors are going to contribute to accidents. That could be management practices, the social norms, morale, training, and incentives. Are there incentives for being more safe? Good question. Feedback concerning accident reduction will reduce the rates of unsafe behaviors. Uh, so, good to know. Training is our primary way that we tell the people about hazards. All right, but all of this is influenced by the social norms. Uh, that is, the attitude and behaviors of the social peers of the worker or operator. And our workers will engage in an unsafe behavior to the extent their peers do right so you go in a uh, you go in a setting where there's a sign on the outside door that clearly says hard hats and goggles required you go inside no one's wearing their hard hat and the goggles are down around their neck well that's a, a social norm in that place and that has to be nipped in the bud. All right, well, one thing that contributes, obviously, to safety is uh, human error. Okay, so in America, we have probably over a uh, 100,000 deaths a year from medical errors. I am not sure of the current statistic, but I know it's been hovering around 100,000 uh, deaths per year for many years. Okay, so, wait a minute. Medical errors are mostly preventable. Why aren't we putting the same effort into stopping them that we're putting into COVID-19? I merely pose the question to you. All right, so what is an error? It's an inappropriate human behavior that lowers the system effectiveness or safety. There are usually contributing factors within the system, right? Nobody goes to work saying, oh, I'm going to do an error today. Well, some might. We'll get to that part in a minute. 
but an accident is a chain of events that leads to the accident. Uh, such as the stories that I read you at the beginning. Right? The lady in the convenience store did not know that, could not see that there was a liquid on the floor because the sun was in her eyes. She slipped and injured herself severely. The four-year-old climbed up on the fountain and the people who had installed it hadn't read the directions that you have to use construction adhesive so that it, uh, when you put the pieces together, they are cemented together and they stay as one unit. All right, so when we classify errors, we have errors of commission. In other words, we do something that causes the error. We have errors of omission. We forget to do something or don't know to do something that causes the error. So we classify these errors in different ways. The first way is as a mistake. Uh, in that case, the action that was inappropriate was an intended action. Right? So you can have knowledge-based mistakes where you have failures of understanding and perceptual errors, right? They perceived the situation wrong, took the wrong action, but it was a mistake. You can have rule-based mistakes where the person is unaware of the rule or they misapply the rule uh, governing appropriate behavior. Of course, that lack of knowledge is more likely in our novices. A slip, not a slip like on the floor slip, but a, a slip is an incorrect action that wasn't intended. Uh, uh, All right, so commission errors uh, that are not intended, they can be caused by bad or confusing links between the display and the control. Of course, we went over, um, we went over uh, displays uh, earlier in this course and controls. And so now, damn it, you should be experts. All right. I don't expect expertise, but at least awareness. There can be confusing, similar appearing uh, switches. So somebody flips the wrong switch. Uh, a poor uh, display control compatibility, right? So that people think, oh, if I turn the knob this way, it makes it do this, when in actuality, it's exactly the other way. We can even sometimes see errors slipping, usually because uh, their attention is wandering a bit. All right, so a lapse is a non-intentional error or errors of omission. In, uh, so we usually we say that's a failure of pro prospective memory. All right, now the reason we differentiate is that mistakes, slips, and lapses can have different remediation uh, uh, strategies. All right, then we can also have a violation where the user intentionally does an inappropriate action. Uh, so, it can be a knowledge-based mistake, a rule-based mistake. Oh, come on, guys. You're not, you're not going to spot me the E? What the hell? Or it can just be a 
a, a, a violation, somebody intentionally doing something they know is not right. Unintended errors are slips and lapses. All right, so the, uh, in errors and system safety, the human at the sharp end, uh, the sharp end is actually where the accident happens. Often they're a contributing factor. But usually they are the final error in a whole series of events that has gone on. So it is embedded in the pre-existing conditions that the circumstances are right for an accident. Sometimes we call these pre-existing conditions resident pathogens. They can be things like poor environmental conditions, right? You never clean up the oil uh, in the garage and so people are slipping all over the place. It can be poor human factors uh, at, of the interface. Can be inappropriate. Hmm, shouldn't that be one word? Yeah, there we go. Inappropriate sleep schedules and fatigue. Poor training. Poor job support. Poor man, uh, maintenance. Can be the management attitudes. You know, oh, nobody's been hurt over there yet. And it can be a generally poor workplace climate. So we often talk about the safety culture of an organization. And um, all of the above can be part of a bad safety culture or the opposite can be part of a good safety culture. Often, uh, the operators get blamed. I've talked to you about this before. Um, the operator error may be attributed to a bad decision, but that may be hindsight bias because it was only a decision error in hindsight. So we have to distinguish between when human behavior is partly responsible and when it's totally responsible. Finger pointing at the operator is very common and it's very often unfair when we look back at it. That is a detriment to the investigation that we need to run because our operators are not likely to speak honestly with the investigators if they've already been blamed. We need free and useful self-reporting, uh, right? Oh, uh, uh, supervisor, I made, I made a little error over here. We need to know about these things. They provide valuable data about the hazards and risks in our workplace that we may have some inkling of or we may have no idea. All right, so how do we remediate errors? All right, so our causal error taxonomies, in other words, was it a mistake, a slip, a lapse, a violation, can help us reveal the solutions. We often think of it in terms of error containment where we design systems that are error tolerant. Look, 
human beings are inherently fallible. We want the system designed so that we catch and we trap errors. So, what do we mean when we say error tolerant? Well, where we give feedback to the operator on current conditions, feedback about future consequences of actions, and monitoring actions for possible errors. Uh, okay, well, that will be it for this uh, lecture. Uh, next time, we are going to start on hazard identification and control. Bum, bum, bum! Okay, it seems hollow to do it by myself. Troopers, I hope you enjoyed this lecture as much as I enjoyed giving it. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and when the fields are white with daisies, we'll meet again.